Several years ago, my wife Kathy and I took our three boys to the Wisconsin Dells during the winter to one of those places that has a huge indoor water park so they could run some of the cabin fever out of them that winter. And the way that the resort set up their water park was that you had to walk past an arcade to get to the water park. Now, not a cool 1980s video arcade with Galaga and Ms. Pac-Man, but the kind of arcade where you buy a bunch of tokens and play skee-ball and whack-a-mole. Do you know what I'm talking about? That kind of arcade. So every time, okay, do I have to define what an arcade is? Is this how we're going to be today, church? Is this how we're going to be? So uh, every time we walk past the arcade, they, they hear the music, they see the lights flashing, they're like, Dad, Dad, let's go to the arcade. And I'm like, no, it's a waste of money. We're here for the water park. So we'd walk to the water park, past it, back to our room from it, back and forth, until finally the kids wore me out. And I'm like, fine, we're on vacation. They want to go to the arcade. Let's go to the arcade. We'll have some fun there at the arcade. So uh, I, I get on my wallet, and I buy each of my three boys $10 worth of tokens, because I'm a pretty rich guy. And, and I said to them, boys, don't come back for two hours. <laughs> they were back in nine minutes with zero tokens left, but they had something better than tokens. They had wide eyes, they had excitement, they had electric energy, and they had tickets. Dad, look at all these tickets that we won. Now, if, if you're new to arcade, and apparently all of you are, in an arcade, tickets are the key to everything, okay? These things unlock amazing, life-changing prizes, and you will never be the same if you can just get enough tickets. So I'm looking at the kids and all their excitement, and suddenly I realize something about the arcade, and we're on vacation, so this is important to notice. Here's what I realized. It's an equation. More tickets equals more happy. And, and we want to be happy on vacation. And, and their enthusiasm, their passion, it was kind of infectious. So I said, okay, boys, here's the deal. I will buy everyone one more round of tokens. And this is going to be it. But we are going to rob this place blind, okay? So by, by everyone, I also bought myself some tokens this time. And because and, and the boys would love it, watching their dad reel in all these lines of, to of tickets, right? So, so we had the place to ourselves. So I start casing the place, looking for the vulnerable machines I can exploit for the most tickets. And, and as I'm walking through, do you know what I notice? Some fool left some tickets hanging out of the machine. So I grabbed those tickets and I hand them to the boys and they're like, yeah, dad. And they high five and they cheer and they're excited. And we go up to ski ball and we are raining in those $500 point buckets and we are, the tickets are spitting out of the machine. And then we time the ball drop and it is raining tickets. And then we spin that wheel and, and we are suddenly flooded in tickets and tickets and tickets. And, and finally this time we expend our tokens. And, and we don't just walk up to the prize counter, we swagger up to the prize counter because when they see the pile of tickets we have, they're probably just going to slide over the keys to the arcade, okay? That's, we're going to buy the whole thing with this pile of tickets. So we, we drop our mountain of tickets on the counter. And do you know what we got? <laughs> Actually brought it along. I'll show you what we got. We got a, a mini Rubik's Cube. four pencils, <laughs> and two Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> and I think we were so excited about our tickets. You know, it's kind of funny, as humans, how excited we can get about our tickets, isn't it? We, th we think tickets are the key to everything. We think that tickets are the key to a happy life. In fact, when, when we look at money in our world as grown-ups, I mean, you think we'd outgrow this, we'd learn in the arcade as kids, but when we look at money, do you know what most of us think? Whether on a conscious level or not, here's what we think. We think that more money equals more happy. And if I can just get enough of those tickets, if I can just get enough of that money, then I will finally be happy. Now, this is even though 
your grandma says money won't make you happy, and the preacher says money won't make you happy, and people who won the lottery said money didn't make us happy, and the notorious B.I.G. said the more money we come across, the more problems we see, you hear all of that and you think to yourself, okay, I know money won't make me happy, but I will volunteer for the experiment. I, I will take one for the team. For the good of my fellow man, I volunteer for the money experiment just to make sure that money won't make me happy. Now, the truth is, there is a connection between money and happiness. In fact, this might be a little controversial to say in church, but the biblical authors tell us there is a connection between your personal finances and your happiness. In fact, uh, the first verse I want to look at today is from the New Testament book of 1 Timothy, where Paul the Apostle wrote this. He said, command those who are rich in this present world. Pause. Okay. If, if you want to know who's rich, that's us. We are America. We are sea to shining sea, the most resourced country on planet Earth. We are the number one in first world countries, okay? We are rich by all global standards. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, your trust in wealth, which is so uncertain, pause, how many of you in the last few months have looked at your personal finances or the national economy and felt uncertain? Would you raise your hand? Okay, so, so scripture is true. Um, wealth is uncertain. So, so Paul says, don't put your hope there. It's uncertain. It will shift and you will fall flat if that's where your hope is. But put your hope in God. That's where your confidence belongs. That's where your hope belongs. And then he closes it up this way. Who richly provides us with everything... Why does God richly provide you? I mean, we are rich in this present world. No shame in that. We we're just born in America. Or we moved to America. It's who we are. We are rich in this present world. Why are we rich? Why has God richly provided for us? Why do we have so many more possessions than other people on the planet do? God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God richly provides so you would have what? Thank you. Enjoyment. The purpose is that money would lead us to joy. The scriptures say there is to be a connection between your personal finances and your joy, your personal finances and your happiness. But if you're anything like most Americans, when you look at your financial reality, the word that springs to your mind is not joy. It is not happiness. If you are anything like most Americans, the words we associate with our personal finances are stress, worry, fear, anxiety, but not happiness, not joy. And if that's you, then perhaps, and this, I don't want to offend you, I'm not trying to offend you, but perhaps we've never been taught what the actual connection is between your money and happiness. Because there is one. But we think, we assume something. We assume that the relationship is governed by the word more. We assume that the connection between money and happiness is the word more. If I have more money, then I will have more happy. Now, let's go with this theory for a moment, shall we? I mean, I know you don't think this. I'm just talking to the other people for a minute. Let's go with this theory. Let's pretend that the relationship between your money and your happiness is governed by the word more. If that's the reality, that means there is a problem with your personal finances that is keeping you away from happiness. What's the problem that more addresses? If the solution is more, then the problem is scarcity. That, that, that's the problem that more solves. It means you have scarcity. So if we can overcome the scarcity problem with more, then you will unleash the happiness. Then you will unleash the enjoyment when it comes to your personal finances. The problem with this theory is that your experience doesn't line up with this belief, does it? See, you've known people who have more than you, more money, more income, more possessions, they have bigger, better, shinier, faster, whatever it is, they have more of it. In fact, you look at their life, you suppose they might not have any scarcity at all, yet they're not happy. 
Conversely, you know people with more scarcity than you have. They have less. They have smaller. They have a lower standard of vacations and housing and transportation and fashion, yet they are completely and totally happy. Money doesn't seem to stress them out at all. And you don't even need to look to other people for this. Look at your own past. In your past, you have experienced either times of having more or less than you do. Is there any direct correlation between that and your level of happiness? See, when I look back at when I was probably the happiest with my financial reality was somewhere around the age of 21, I had my pickup truck, and if it had half a tank of gas and I had $5 left over for Domino's, guess how I felt? I was like my kids in the arcade, high-fiving and fist-pumping, I'm eating Domino's tonight, okay? Because I had almost nothing, but I was happy. So, so we've all experienced this reality that the relationship between money and happiness isn't governed by the word more. If it were, America would be the happiest place on earth. Our whole country would be Disneyland if that were true. Did you know that in our world today, on average, the per capita income globally is $17,000. Do you know what it is in America? $60,000. Our per capita income is 3.5 times that of not the poor in our world, the average in our world. So um, if, if, if this is true, if the solution to happiness is to have more, Americans would be ridiculously happy when it comes to our personal finances. But here's what a report released earlier this year showed. 65% of Americans feel unable to overcome their money problems. And 90% of Americans say money has a negative impact on their stress levels. We have more. And what's it doing to us emotionally? It's stressing us out. You see, the, the connection between your personal finances and your happiness isn't governed by the word more. But if you want to go ahead and believe that, go ahead. I'm going to challenge you. If that's your belief, if you really want to persist in thinking, if you just have more, then you'll be happy. Here's the question. You owe it to yourself to answer. The question is, okay, how much more? When does the more get to the place where the happy kicks in? How much more? I mean, is there a level where, you know what, my kids are a mess, but I got a bonus, so I'm happy. My marriage is a disaster, but I got a raise, so I'm happy. Is it, you know what? I hate my job, so they promoted me. I'm so happy. Uh, well, you, you owe it to yourself if you believe this. How much more do you need in order for the happiness to kick in? Now, I know the answer to that question. So do you. The answer is more than you currently have. This is always the answer to the question. If you believe that more is what governs the relationship between money and happiness. See, here's what's true. Here's what we all know intuitively. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. The connection between these two is not based on more. But there is a connection. There is a connection between money and enjoyment, money and happiness. And today, we're going to turn to something Jesus taught us to learn what this connection is. And the word that we're going to learn about is the word mastery. When it comes to your money, who is mastering whom? Are you mastering your money or is your money mastering you? Are you in control of your money or is your money in control of you? Are you making decisions for your money and telling it what to do? Or is your money making your life decisions for you? Who is in charge of whom in this relationship? If we understand how to master money, then we will learn how to be free from its control and learn the connection between money and happiness so we can get to the place where your personal financial reality leads to enjoyment. Well, today we're in part two of our series, Plastic Jesus. 
And last week, as we kicked off this series, we looked at something very challenging that Jesus taught. One day, there were crowds of people around him. They weren't like all in with him yet, uh, but there were crowds of people following him. And turning to the crowds, he said, if anyone would follow me, if anyone would be my disciple, I must be the priority. I must be the number one priority in every category of your life, which means if you decide to follow me, it's going to cost you something. That's the nature of a priority, isn't it? You can only have one priority. You can have several goals, but one priority. Jesus said, if you will follow me, I must be the priority, which means there are other things that fall beneath the priority. In fact, here's the bottom line from last week. We said that forgiveness costs you nothing. Jesus paid for the sins of the world just because of his love, just because of his kindness, just because he cares about you. He wants you to live with him forever in heaven. He paid for the sins of the world. Forgiveness costs you nothing. But he said, following costs you everything because he must be the priority if you are going to follow him. Today, we're going to look at what it means in your financial world if Jesus is the priority. Because plastic Jesus doesn't care about how you handle your money. Plastic Jesus doesn't care about if you can feel enjoyment or anxiety around your money. But real Jesus cares about those things. So we're going to look at a place from his life where he taught us about this connection. Now, uh, before I jump into the text, I think it's fascinating to note that Jesus talked about money all the time. I mean, if I, if I preached on money as frequently as Jesus did, I would be talking about money just about once a month, okay? That's how often he talked about money. In fact, there's only one subject he talked about more, and it was the kingdom of God, and that was his whole ministry. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He said, I've come to bring the kingdom of heaven near to earth. But the second topic he talked about was money, more than he talked about angels or anger, more than he talked about pride or power, more than he talked about love or lust, he talked about gold and silver and drachmas and minas and shekels and coins. And not only did he talk about money, he often used money to illustrate more important ideas. Uh, for example, he said, what's the kingdom of heaven like? Well, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure hidden in the field. What's forgiveness like? Well, forgiveness is like when you owe someone a whole bunch of money, but then they choose to cancel the debt that you owe them. What's faithfulness like? Well, faithfulness is like when an employer leaves you in charge of a lot of money and you handle it so well that when he comes back, he's delighted and he gives you a huge promotion. What's Satan like? Well, Satan is like a thief who steals what doesn't belong to him. What's conversion like? Conversion is like a woman who lost a gold coin, and when she found it, she was so excited she threw a party with all of her friends. What's the church like? The church is like a mutual fund where you should deposit all of your money and let them manage it for you. <laughs> okay, I made that one up, seeing if you're still with me. So why did Jesus talk about money as frequently as he did? Was it because he was in constant fundraising mode? No. He had no facility, no grounds, no property. None of his disciples were on salary. He paid his taxes by pulling coins out of fish's mouths. That's pretty cool. I mean, his treasury department was Judas, who stole from the purse. So if you think you have money problems, you can talk to Jesus. He understands. Was it because money gets people's attention? No. He didn't need gimmicks. He was a walking attention machine. Everywhere he went, people were listening, looking, leaning in to what he had to say, to the miracles he was performing. Was it because his community was so affluent and there were always calls to consumerism and materialism? No. It was subsistence living. They were always one drought away from economic disaster. So why did Jesus talk about money as frequently as he did. He tells us why in Luke chapter 16. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, pause. This is the language we looked at last week. 
when he said, if you would follow me, you must hate your father and mother, even your own life, if you're going to be my disciple. This is a word of priority. Something has to come first. And he says, if, if you're going to follow me, I must be the priority, and everything else has to fall beneath that. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Point? You cannot serve both God and money. Now, uh, the word money, we, we think of currency when we think of money. Uh, when Jesus used the word, uh, the connotation of the word wasn't just currency. It was money and everything money can buy. The possessions, the experiences, the lifestyles, all of it was kind of bundled together in this word money. Because I actually had a guy tell me once, pastor, I don't love money. I love the things money can buy. I'm like, it, it still counts. It's Still part of this, okay? So, so Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. He said you will either hate one and love the other. To which you say, perfect, I don't love money. I, I love Jesus. I don't love, I mean, okay, we're seeing each other, but, but I wouldn't use the L word. I mean, we're, we're kind of crushing a little bit. I don't know if I love money. Jesus, what do you mean by love? Devotion. You will be either more devoted to money than God or God than money. Come on, which one? He's asking, which one are you devoted to? Which one consumes your imagination? Which one do you pour your life out for? Which one are you thinking about when you wake up in the middle of the night or when you wake up in the morning? Which one keeps you awake? Which one lets you sleep? Which one are you devoted to? Which one are you researching online? You cannot love, you cannot be devoted to, you cannot make a priority out of both God and money. One of them has to be the priority over the other. And here's why Jesus is saying all of this. Jesus doesn't want your money. Jesus is like, what am I going to buy with your money? I live in heaven, okay? What, what am, what am I going to do? I'm, I can't buy clothes. I'm good, okay? Like, Jesus doesn't want your money. He wants your money to not have you. He's invited you to a life of freedom, but he knew that when it came to what rivals your love for God, it's not the devil, okay? When he says God and money, you think, wait a minute, the opposite of God isn't money. What's the opposite of God? Evil, the devil, Satan. Didn't Jesus mean you can't serve God and the devil? No, because he knows that you're not tempted to put your hope in the devil for your future. But money is the number one rival to God for our love, for our affection, for our trust, for our hope, for our futures. And Jesus said, I know this about you. You are going to be tempted to trust money instead of trusting me and be devoted to money more than you are devoted to me. And once you do that, money is now your master and you are serving it. And Jesus said, I don't want you to be ruled by money because it leads to stress and anxiety and fear and worry because it is so uncertain. And I don't want you to be ruled by that. I want you to be free. And I'm inviting you to follow me and make me your priority in your financial life. Now, when we do that, when you say, okay, when it comes to my financial life, Jesus is the priority, everything else comes after that. Jesus is crystal clear. Will that cost you something? Yes, following Jesus costs you. But one of the things it will cost you is the anxiety you feel related to your money. When we approach personal finances the way that Jesus taught, it will lead to joy and enjoyment with your financial reality. Now, here's the bad news. If you are currently devoted to money, if, if it's your priority more than Jesus, you cannot pray your way out of this situation, okay? It's not something you can just pray your way out of. It's something you behave your way out of. The good news is the path is simple and it's only three steps, and anyone can do it. So with the balance of my time, I want to show you how to submit 
money to your control. If it's your master, if you're devoted to it, how to throw it off the throne and say, Jesus sits there, you serve me now. I serve Jesus, you serve me. You work for me, I work for Jesus, and that's what leads to enjoyment. So there's three easy steps, okay? I'm going to show them to you at the balance of our time, and at the end, I'm going to show you why this approach leads to happiness with your financial reality. You ready? Scared? Preacher's talking about money. Why would I be scared? All right, first step. When money comes your way, step number one, according to the biblical authors, is to give. Give some of it away. Deuteronomy chapter 14 says this. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. This was their paycheck. This was their income in an agrarian society. The the harvest comes in. God says, great, take a tenth of it and set it aside for giving. Why? So that you may learn to, this is interesting, revere the Lord your God always. See, God doesn't need your money. He wants to make sure your money doesn't have you, doesn't control you. So he says, here's how you break free from it. You take a tenth of it and you use it to revere the name of the Lord your God. Now, now why does he use this word? What's the connection here? How does this lead to honoring or revering God's name? It's very simple. Money is nothing more than a tool. It's a tool that we use to ascribe value in our world. So if after church today, you go to the grocery store, every item has ascribed value. It's a price tag. If you go to brunch, every menu item has ascribed value listed on the menu. If you go to the car lot, if you scroll through uh, real estate listings online, everything has ascribed value, and we use money to ascribe the value. And if something is worth it, you exchange the money for the thing. If at your employer, you have an incredible year, and in December, your employer sits you down and says, you added more value to our organization than anybody did this year, what do you expect? Show me the money. Okay, I added the most value? Perfect. Now, you're going to show me some value by giving me a bonus, by giving me a raise. That's how value works. Money is how we ascribe value. That's its purpose. In fact, we even have sayings around this. We say things like, talk is cheap. Why is talk cheap? Because you can say anything. Money shows you what you value. We say things like, put your money where your mouth is. Why? You can say anything. Money shows what you really believe. We say things like, money talks and... What's the rest of that one? Doesn't matter. We, see, see, the point is we know that talk is cheap. Money shows what you revere. And God says, hey, listen, you pray to me, wonderful. I love that. You sing to me in church, wonderful. I love that. But if you really want to value me, you will take some of your money and you will use it for the causes that are near and dear to my heart. And he says, start by giving a tenth of what you produce to what, and give it to what matters to me. Now, when Kathy and I were young, we, we were newlyweds in our early 20s. We got married pretty young. Um, we just decided after we got married, you know what? We're, we are just going to do this. We want God to be part of every aspect of our lives. So we're just going to try this. We're going to do this in our marriage because we want to revere the name of the Lord. So here's what we decided. And and the math here gets complicated, so I thought I would illustrate it for you. We decided, I mean a tenth, how do you figure that out? We decided that every time we got 10 of these, again, early on in marriage, we decided that we would take one of them and we would give it away. Okay, let, let me review. Every time, this is, a ten, this is how a tenth works. Every time we got ten of these, we would take one and we would give it away to a cause that matters to God, that blesses people, that makes the world a better place, that changes lives and changes eternities. We, that's what we decided. And then we decided, well, then that means every time we get a hundred of these, we're going to take ten of those and give it away. And then we're going to have 90 left. So every time we get a hundred bucks, we're going to treat it like it's or 100 bucks, we're going to treat it like it's 90. And then we decided, well, what that means is every time we get 1,000 of these, 
what we're going to have to do is we're going to take a hundred of them and give them away. So every time we see a thousand dollars, we're going to treat it like it's nine hundred dollars because we're taking that hundred and we're giving it away. Now, when we were in our early twenties, that was easy. We couldn't even imagine getting a thousand dollars at once. This doesn't even apply to us. So, so that was easy. But we just decided for us in our marriage, this is how we are going to revere the name of the Lord our God in our marriage. Now. Here's why this gives you mastery over your money. Because every time money comes along, do you know what it wants to do? It wants to boss you around. When you take, when you take one of them and you say, you, I'm bossing you around. You're going to go do that. Do you know what it does to the other ones? It makes them afraid. <laughs> they're, 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 they're not messing around. They might, you know, hey, hey, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm in charge of you. I'm giving you away. And then if one talks back, oh, really? You're gone too, buddy, right? So he just puts the rest of them in line. That's what giving does. It tells your money what it's going to do. And if God matters to me, you are going to go do something in this world that matters to God. And in our family, in our marriage, that has taught us to revere the name of the Lord, our God. We haven't regretted that decision for a second because it helped lead to peace in our financial reality. Now, here's where I want to acknowledge the pushbacks some of you are thinking right now because I have the microphone, you don't. Totally unfair. Here's what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, oh, okay, that, that was clever, Jason. That was clever. Okay, you, you talked about the connection between money and happiness, and I admit, I leaned in because I feel pretty anxious about my money, but I see now, this is about give to the church. Got it. Okay? It's fair. I will freely acknowledge the church has not always handled this well. But I'm going to ask you to be fair, too. How many times have I said give to the church? I haven't said give to the church. I said give a tenth. See, I've got verses that say give a tenth. I don't have verses that say give to the church. I don't have verses that say give to Hope Church. I really wish that verse were there. It would really make this easier. But I don't. So if you are going to master your money, if you are going to follow Jesus. Now, by the way, if you're not a Christian, you're like, I don't want to follow Jesus. That's fine. You can try this. It, it will lead to joy with your financial reality when you see all three steps. For those of us who follow Jesus or those of us who don't, what do you do with it then? What do you do with that tenth you give away? That's easy. Two things. Number one, give from a grateful heart. There are organizations and causes in this world, and you are so grateful they do what they do you, because they are blessing people. They are having an impact in people's lives. They are changing people's eternal lives. They are improving the lives of families. You are so grateful for what they do. Maybe there is a season of life where you benefited from a cause or an organization, or maybe you are right now. Whatever you are grateful for that is a cause that matters to God, go fund it. Make a difference. Help them be successful. Now, what does that mean for the church? If you are new to Hope Church, you're not grateful for our church then don't give it to us. Go give it to a cause you're grateful for. If you've been around here a while, and if you're not grateful for our church, what are you doing here? Seriously, you should be grateful for your church. Your, your life should be getting better at your church, okay? I'm just going to put that out. If you're not grateful for our church and you've been here a while, I will help you find a church that you will be grateful for because you need to be grateful for your church because we're talking about Jesus, so if we're your church and you're grateful, yes, one of the causes you support is your local church because you're grateful for them. Give to causes you're grateful for and give from a broken heart. We live in a broken world. There are things that are not right and some of them break your heart. And what breaks your heart might not break the next person's heart, but it breaks your heart. There's probably somebody doing something about that. Go help them be successful. See, we believe, Christians believe, that at the end of time, Jesus will come back and he will make everything new, which means if we're going to mimic Christ in our world, in our little sphere of influence, we make things new. We make things better. So when it comes to what you do with the money you give away, give from a grateful heart, 
give from a broken heart, but give first. Put your money in check. Show it who's boss. Honor God with it. Give from a grateful heart, broken heart. Second thing after we do, after we give, is we save. Give first, save second. Look at what Proverbs 21 says. The wise store up. What do the wise do? They store up choice food and olive oil, but fools, what do fools do? They gulp theirs down. If, if you are not saving, now, I would never say this. I'm telling you what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said about this. If, if you are just gulping it all down, he said that's what fools do. Wise people know there is going to be a challenge in the future. There's going to be a rainy day. There's going to be a flat tire. There's going to be a medical bill. That's why wise people save theirs up. So that's the second thing we do with our money. We give first, we save second, and then you decide, I'm going to live on whatever is left over after I give and save. Give first, save second, whatever is left, that's my limit. Not more than that, but only that. Here's what Proverbs also says. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is what? Slave to the lender. Once you are in debt, if you are not content to live within your means, you are no longer free. You have a master, and it is money. You have a master, and it is the bank. You have a master, and it is the credit card. It is Visa. It is MasterCard. Why do you think they call it MasterCard? Because it is now in control of your life. It is making your decisions for you. That's why the biblical approach to being free from money, to making it serve you so you are its master, is to give first, save second, and live on whatever is left over. This doesn't just make money subservient to you. It's how we serve Jesus. When we give first, save second, and live on whatever's left over. Give, save, live. Give, save, live. That's what leads to happiness. Let me show you why. Giving yields joy. Do you know anybody who's just a completely generous person? Think of someone you know. They, they are just generous. They are always helping out, always picking up the tab, always being generous. You know anyone like that? You should. They're the best friends to have, right? Because they're fun. They're happy. They're full of joy. Do you know any greedy people? Do you know any stingy people? Would you, would you, just, would you use the word joy to describe them? No. See, generosity opens up the part of our lives where God's joy can come in and fill that. And when you are generous, when you give, you get to see before your very eyes how your contribution is changing people's lives or changing people's eternities. And that brings joy. That brings satisfaction. You're taking money that isn't even yours. You're going to leave it here when you go. But while you have it here, God said, this is mine. I want you to manage it. You can use some of it to do good. And that's just fun. That brings joy. Giving yields joy. Savings yields peace. Okay, because this is about margin, okay? Have you, have you ever driven on a very narrow road? If you do, you drive slowly, and what are you focused on? You are laser glued on the edge of the road because there's no margin. When it comes to your financial life, if you don't have margin, what are you focused on? Your money. If you have margin, you're not worried about it because you've saved. You know you have a cushion. You know you have margin. When you have savings, you have peace. That's where savings kicks in. Give first, that yields joy. Save second, that yields peace. And then finally, living on the rest yields freedom. Nobody financially controls you. No one financially can tell you what to do. You are in control of your own life's decisions because you decided to live on whatever is left over. Giving yields joy, saving yields peace. Living on the rest yields freedom. This is the formula for becoming a happy person with money, and this is how we make Jesus the priority in your financial life. And what other way would we have it than to do it the Jesus way? Because Jesus was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He was rich with the splendor of heaven, but he looked at us in our poverty, in our need, in our sin, in our brokenness, and he said, I will enter into that. I will give up my riches and enter into their sorrow and into their pain, and I will bear their sin so that they can have forgiveness for free. 
And you know that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor so that through his poverty, we have become rich. Listen, our wealth isn't going to be found here. Our wealth is with Jesus and it's waiting for us. Our treasure isn't going to be found here. Our treasure is with Jesus, and it's waiting for us. That's our hope. That's our confidence. That's our Jesus. And now he's inviting you. Follow me. Make me your true priority. Make me the true love of your heart. I want you to revere my name. Here's what this means. If if you're going to do this, here's what this means. It means some of of us couples are going to have to go home and have a conversation today. It means all of us are going to have to do some honest evaluation. You don't have to tell me anything. Again, if you don't trust me, you don't have to give a dollar here. This is about you being free from money and following Jesus. And some of us say, okay, I get that, but I'm not able to do that right now. Okay, if you're not able to do that right now, two points. Number one, are you not able or you just don't want to? You just don't want to follow Jesus. Which one is it? Because Jesus drew this as a line. He said, what are, you, are you going to follow me or not? But let's not play games about it. Let's be clear about what you're going to do. Second point, some of you might be in a situation where, no, legitimately, you've, not, you've been living a typical American lifestyle, okay? There's zero margin. Okay, what is your step Today, what is your step to throw off the mastery of money to follow Jesus and get to the place of enjoyment? Because what, 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 if, what if someone had sat you down 10 years ago and said, hey, listen, I want to show you how to honor Jesus with your wealth, and you started doing it. What do you think your relationship with your personal finances would look like today if you started doing this 10 years ago or 20 years ago? I bet you know the answer to that question. You'd probably be pretty happy. But you're going to have to decide. What am I devoted to? What do I serve? What do I love? Is it Jesus or is it money? Because you cannot serve two masters. Let me pray for you. Jesus, your words challenge us in our culture, perhaps more than any other culture in history. These words are timely for us to hear because they're a line of clarity that you draw. And I know that for many of us, as we're sitting here, we've felt the conviction of your Holy Spirit pointing out to us how we've been more devoted to money and stuff than to our eternal Savior who loves us. Jesus, you are so amazing that in spite of that reality, you are still kind, you are still patient, you are still forgiving to the end. We thank you for that. I ask that our love, our awe, our reverence for you will grow and grow and grow so that we will be people who trust you and prioritize you and become free from being bossed around by money. You invite us to enjoyment. You invite us to peace. So give us the courage to take this path and follow you. We pray this for your glory and that we may be a people who revere your holy name.
Hey everyone, my name is James and I'm on staff here at Hope Church and I just want to say thank you for checking out that last video. If you found that content helpful, please let us know by hitting that like button and be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you get notified every time we go live or post new content. We do live stream our services every Sunday starting at 825 Central. We have a growing online community that we would love for you to come and be a part of. And if you have any more questions about us here at Hope Church, be sure to check out the links down below.